And now he's finally out of WrestleMania. It's WrestleMania six. It's in Toronto. Uh, and he is wrestling the macho King. Uh, how does that come about? This is another match where you just seemingly, uh, what is going on? Here's a, a WWF guy. And now here is really a guy. We all identify as an NWA guy. And maybe, you know, a year or two earlier, this would have been a dream match because both of those guys were near the top of their game. And now, you know, one's in polka dots and one's wearing a crown. What happened? <laughs> it was what you just said. It was two of the stop, top stars in the game. It was Randy and Dusty and, and the characters, the Macho King looking down on everybody. And the guys that the Macho King's looking down upon are the common people. And you got the leader of the common people, the common man, the American Dream, Dusty Rhodes. And you got Miss Sapphire. And you got uh, Queen Sherry. It was a match made in heaven. And it, it was, uh, I'll tell you a, a great story because I had been out with them during the summer. And it was a mixed tag team match with the Macho King and Queen Sherry against Dusty and Sapphire. In Dusty and Sapphire's corner was Miss Elizabeth. In Savage's corner was Brother Love. Oh, wow. So we did these matches all around the horn, and it was, without a doubt, some of the most fun I have ever had in the business because Dusty and I would travel together a lot during that time. I either traveled with with Randy and Liz or I traveled with Dusty. And, oh, my God, we we just had a blast together, just uh, up and down the roads and, and having a lot of fun. But when we first started this match, we laid out the match. Randy liked to lay things out. We laid out the match. And Dusty dictated a lot of it, if you will. And the match, in short, kind of consisted of myself, Randy, and Sherry running into Dusty's elbow. <laughs> dream, dream didn't move. The elbow just stayed up in position, and our heads found it. I see. And I am having an absolute blast every night. Just working with Dusty, having fun, working with Randy and Sherry and everybody. I mean, we are having a blast. And we're kind of doing the same thing every night, every night, you know, and, and we're doing this for about two, three, four weeks, maybe three weeks. And we finally get to Hamilton, Ontario, and we got a double shot. So we're doing a show in the afternoon and another uh, show that night in Toronto. Well, Pat Patterson is the agent for both shows, and Pat has not yet seen our match. He says, what have you guys been doing? And he says, well, you know, we'll show you tonight. So we go out or during the day, the first show. So we go out and we have the match and we come back and we're like, what'd you think? And he says, how are you guys getting to Toronto? I said, well, we actually were going to ride with somebody. He says, ride with me. So this is Pat Patterson telling Randy and myself and Liz to ride with him. Right. So we get in the car. He had a, he had a limousine and we get in the car and on the way there, Pat tells us it was one of the worst matches he had ever seen in his wow. life. He says, I hated it. Oh, my God, Randy, you're a WWF champion, and you're out there, and you're bumping all over for him, and you're not getting anything in, and he makes you look like a piece of garbage. And essentially, he's getting Randy fired up. Because he's like telling him, he's abusing you and now you're bumping and you're making he doesn't do anything and you're a champion and everybody, they love you. And brother love, what the hell? He goes, you get in for the match. You get in one time, one time only. You got heat. Why you go in and bump all over for him? We think about it. And Pat's telling us everything that's wrong with the match that we laid out that we loved. Right. And he's making sense. He's making a lot of sense. But to be 
just real blunt, man, we were fans of Dusty and we were having a good time (laughs) working with the dream and doing all of his stuff. So he says, let's come up with a different match. So we come up with a completely different match with basically Randy controlling the majority of the match and getting heat on Dusty and Dusty making his comeback and Brother Love gets in at the very end and Dusty gets one shot at Brother Love and that's the finish and and we're out of there. So we get to Toronto and we have this match. Randy and I have this whole match laid out. I mean, we've got it got it completely laid out and Randy says he's fired up. I mean, he's, he's just all bowed up. He's ready to go. And he's like, where's Virgil? Where is he? And he hadn't gotten there yet. Let me know as soon as he gets in and we need to talk to him. So Dusty comes in, puts his bag down and they say, Hey, uh, Dusty's in the back dressing room over there. So we go marching in and, and Randy goes over to, to Dusty says, Green, we need to talk to you for a minute uh, in here. So we walk around the corner, go into the shower. That's where you had all your private meetings. <laughs> it's in a shower or a bathroom stall. So <coughs> we we get in, and Randy starts off by going, Oh, uh, yeah, uh, we were talking to Pat about the match, and uh, he didn't like it, and uh, we had... We had some changes and things like that. And uh, we're going to make some changes tonight. So, um, Brother Love, go ahead and tell him what the match is. Oh, wow. <laughs> oh, wow. And I, I'm looking at Randy like, why me? And yeah, go, yeah, go, ahead, go ahead, go ahead. And so I lay the match out to Dusty. And Dusty has got his back against the wall in the shower and is looking at me with these giant bug eyes. Doesn't say a word throughout the entire spiel. And we're finished. And Randy's like, oh, okay, well, what do you think? And Dream just looks at it and says, baby, you know, this is kind of like somebody going in and grabbing Babe Ruth and pulling him in the shower and telling him how to Hit the ball, if you will. And there's silence, and Randy says, Well, babe, that's what we're doing tonight. See you in the <laughs> ring. <laughs> <laughs> and it was, I mean, it was just classic dusty, and we went out, you know, we tore it up. But, uh, yeah, it, brother, yeah. Okay, babe. And from that point on, he was babe to us. And that's amazing. Every night we would go out and go, Hey, babe, uh, that's what we're doing. Baby, so, <laughs> you know, but that was just typical dusty. So you mentioned Good a minute stuff. ago, um, Sapphire, you know, I'm really struggling with this. How is this not a rib Sapphire as a valet? First of all, who is she? Where do y'all find her? Whose idea was it? And then what was dusty's reaction? a lot of questions i got a question for you first okay why do you think sapphire is a rib okay (laughs) um the valets in wrestling at the time are missy hyatt miss elizabeth is there another one Okay, well, let, let, let's take a Missy woman. Missy Hyatt. I don't think I don't know if she was active at the time, or but she may have been with Eddie Gilbert at the time. Look at Eddie Gilbert. Look at Missy Hyatt. Look at Miss Elizabeth. Look at Randy Savage. So, are you oh, telling me wow. that when you compare those and, and you're looking at a female counterpart to the male counterpart, the common man? would have a common woman by his side. He wouldn't have some beautiful stripper esque gorgeous girl by his side. He'd have a common woman. He'd have a common common lady by his side. So are you going to suggest that Sapphire was not a rib? Absolutely not. Sapphire was there to enhance Dusty in the American Dream and the Common Man. That wasn't a rib. Again, I, I, I keep going to the same point. We didn't do things for a rib and especially invest that much money on something in a character. Oh, well, let's just have fun with him. No, it, it was it was there to enhance 
that character and make him more relatable. Was there any thought put into her being black? Was that Not, strategic? Well, you know, it was, I don't know that it necessarily was. We need a black woman. No, we needed a common woman. And Juanita, who was Sapphire, was a former lady wrestler from Kansas City that had, you know, she had wrestled around the circuit as princess something or other. But uh, Terry Garvin knew of a woman. And when we started talking about we need a, a common woman and he says, I've got just the person, you know, and it would help if she had taken bumps before and different things like that. But we didn't want a striking beauty, if you will, not to say that Sapphire wasn't beautiful in her own way, but we were looking for just a common woman and she fit that bill. Who suggested her? Who suggested the character Sapphire? Sapphire specifically. Who said, Hey, I know a lady. Uh, that was Terry Garvin. Okay. Who came up with her. Yeah. Who found her. Who in the meeting said, we need a common woman. I was Vince. Okay. Yeah. All right. So now here's the big one. What did Dusty <laughs> think about working with her? I don't know that Dream was necessarily thrilled with working with Sapphire. I don't think that he felt he needed any enhancement. So I think Dusty kind of looked at her as a handicap versus an enhancement so uh i don't know why my brain automatically went there but when you said the word enhancement a lot of people online refer to that era of the wwf as the steroid era um was there any pressure or any conversation about dusty trying to change his physique and by saying that i don't mean necessarily that anybody say go take steroids i'm not asking that i'm asking did he feel the need to try to trim down to drop some weight uh, was there any conversation about him just trying to change his physique for WWF television? Yes, there was. And Dusty brought that up. And Dusty, when he started and he came up in a conversation with Vince, told Vince that he was eating salads and chicken breasts and was on a diet and exercising and hitting the treadmill and all these things. And Vince looked at him and said, why? I want you as you are. I want to see the puppies. I want the flab. I, I, don't change a thing. So to the contrary, and Dusty felt that he needed to get in, get in shape, if you will. Dusty was in great shape, an incredible athlete. This was a big guy. Right. But he could move for a big guy. And, you know, I laugh when people would say, oh, my God, look at that sloppy son of a bitch. How can that be an athlete? He was a stud. Throughout his entire career, even then, he could move and he could go. So help me understand when you're saying um, puppies, and I know I'm circling back to something silly here. Are you suggesting that Vince McMahon coined that phrase and not Jerry Lawler? Are you crushing all of my dreams here today? I think I'm crushing your dreams there, pal. <laughs> yes. So Vince McMahon. That's a Vince term, puppies. Uh -huh. Okay. I, I don't think that, well, I didn't know that. Maybe the whole internet knew that and I didn't put, uh, so, uh, the music is iconic. The dusty roads theme song. Uh, is that something that you guys just had in the can for somebody at some point, or was that specific for dusty roads as far as the beat and all that? Obviously 100%, the lyrics. 100% specific for dusty roads written and performed by, uh, Jimmy Hart. Wow. And that was that was for for Dusty, and Jimmy wrote it, and with his uh, partner, I think his partner's name was Jimmy McGuire, and they knocked it out of the park. He uh, Jimmy Hart also did Big Boss Man too, two iconic themes for sure. Yeah, so it was uh, without a doubt definitely for Dusty Rhodes. So then, as we continue to talk about the pay per views, uh, Macho would work again with Dusty at SummerSlam. But then Survivor Series 1990, Dusty Rhodes is on the babyface team, and there is a debut heel character on the opposite side of the ring, and it's Kane the Undertaker. Um, and then that was pretty much the beginning of the end for Dusty. Uh, kind of tell us your memories about, um, you know, Mean Mark Callis then debuting uh, at that Survivor Series and Dusty's involvement in that match because they would have certainly crossed paths in the past. 
Uh, did anybody have any sort of issue with putting over this new guy so strong? And then kind of what was the exodus for Dusty from the WWF? You know, I don't re- I remember that, obviously. Um, but there was there was no problem at all with making sure that everybody in that match, it was that match was designed to get the undertaker over in a huge debut and to make him look like a, a killer in there. And dusty was a big part of that. You know, it may have been the fact that I just whipped dusty's ass so bad on the outside of the ring that night that he had to leave in shame, having brother love, have oh whoop his ass on the outside of the ring that maybe that's why he had to stick his tail between his legs and leave. But no, <laughs> no. actually, when, when Dusty left, Dusty had an opportunity to go back to Atlanta in a in a booking position. And he went to Vince and says, hey, you know, they got a shakeup down here, and I've been offered my old job back. And Vince wouldn't stand in his way. Now, here's my question. We started this conversation, and I do want to circle back to Dustin for a minute, but... I want to follow up on that thought right there because we started this conversation by talking about, you know, Vince didn't really make guarantees on contracts and we just talked through what the Vince pitch was and it was kind of understood that most guys would believe they would make more money. And you said in most cases they do. So if this is for more money and he's making more money right now, why the hell would he want to go back to his old job? Power and the lure of more money there. So he felt like the booking position there would pay more than a performer with dolls and magazines and everything else. Right. Because he was in charge and he was also working and in a position to put himself in a top position and be a part of everything. Which he didn't do when he went back, by the way. He went back as a booker, but no, I don't, I don't think he, he didn't book himself into anything. He didn't book himself into that. No. So, uh, the last, you know, sort of time we'll see him on WWF TV for a long time is the Royal Rumble 1991, uh, right around that early 1991 period, and he's tagging with Dustin Rhodes. Is there any sort of irony in the fact that they are wrestling Ted DiBiase and Virgil on his way out, that it's Virgil versus Virgil? Is there any real thought put into that? Because that, too, to me, seems like a rib, that Virgil Reynolds' (laughs) last pay-per-view match is against a character manservant that was also named Virgil after him. Absolutely not. Cause we had, we had done the program with DiBiase and, and brought Dustin in and it was just conclusion to that program. How does that come about? Does Dusty recommend Dustin coming to the, to New York or does Vince ask about him? No, Dusty recommended him. He was in uh, Kansas city at the time and we were coming through there and we actually put him on some of the house shows that we had and Dustin did a hell of a job. So we brought him in and did a little something with him at the time. Why was there not a play to try to keep him or do something bigger with him? And just, instead of just letting him go back with his dad, because Dusty wanted him back. Okay. Dusty wanted him to come with him and out of respect to Dusty, you know, it's, that's the other thing that people don't always realize with Vince McMahon is, I know there's times that he's maybe gone back on his word with some people, but for the most part, if he gives you his word, that he's going to do something, he'll do it. And he's fair and he's, he really doesn't do things out of malice. Right. You know, there, there's exceptions to that rule, obviously, but Dusty had an opportunity to go back and, uh, it's what he was going to be happy doing having the booking position in Atlanta. And Vince was like, if you're going to be happier there, I don't want somebody here that's going to be unhappy. And if your son feels more comfortable being there working with you and you want him, I'm not going to stand in his way either. So those are things that, that he's done a lot of times over the years that people don't realize. And they wonder, well, that doesn't make any sense it it did because for the right business reasons of having a happy camper or an unhappy camper, go ahead and if you got an unhappy camper, get him out of camp. Yeah, that makes sense. So let's talk about some fun stuff. Let's kind of rapid fire some of these. I'm sure you've got some fun stories here. Um, 
True or false? Dusty roads in the locker room, cowboy boots, and not much else. Yeah, pretty much. Or a t-shirt. But no pants. No pants. No. First thing Dream did when he got into a locker room was drop his drawers. <laughs> what? Why does Dusty hate pants so much? I don't know. Maybe they, maybe he got chafed or something. But, uh, yes, that's a true story. That's pretty much true wherever he was. 